Hey, Fedheads, welcome to another episode of Sharing Our Pairings. This is Sharing Our Pairings, episode 107. Are you not entertained? I'm your host, John the Cigar Surgeon. We are broadcast live around the world and picked up on the Armed Forces <laughs> Radio Network. Sharing Our Pairings, of course, is picked up on CigarFederation.com, broadcast on YouTube.com, and of course on Facebook Live. Thanks to all our Facebook Live listeners and all our podcast listeners out there. Thanks for tuning in. We know you're out there in droves. Sharing Our Pairings is sponsored by Gurkha Cigars. More about that later. I'm joined, as always, by my co-host, Trippy Trent. Trippy, what's going on on this lovely Wednesday evening? Not much. Ready to uh, have a probably extra long show with these big old things. Big old things. And, of course, we are joined by our very special guest tonight, Barry Stein from the Cigar Authority. Barry, thanks so much for being on our show. Gentlemen, thank you for having me. Um, Life is grand here in New Hampshire. The cold weather is finally broken. Yay! 94 degrees today, and it's like being back home Ooh. in Miami. Oh, wow. Now, isn't that kind of on the warm side for New Hampshire this early in the season? Everybody around me is dying, but I'm the fat guy that loves heat. <laughs> so bring it on. Bring it on. Back in Miami. Yeah, I always get that when I travel to uh, NICA. Everyone says, you know, isn't the heat a little bit too much? And it's like, no, man. Like, you know, and, and of course, you got those section of people that always want the cold. I am not the section of people that want cold. I always say, bring on the heat. I'll take heat over cold any day. You and I are in the same boat. Absolutely. Yep, I'm the same way. So, of course, if you're tuned in live, you are checking out us smoking some large, very large cigars. And we'll get into that in just a second. Uh, we, are of course, doing pairing, which is what our show is all about. And tonight we're pairing the Asylum 13. And we'll do a little roundtable as we go around. I'm smoking the 80, which is the monstrous... 6x80, uh, extra specially large because I'm not an overly big dude. Trip, what are you smoking within the, the total I have size? got the same blend. It is the 7x70. And, and Barry? I, I'm going the route of uh, a cigar that was released for Tobacco Association of America members, the Asylum 13 TAA, which measures 7x70, but it happens to be box-pressed. I, I'd be lying if I, if I said I wasn't jealous because, uh, you know, and, and Barry, I know you, and we'll get into this actually right now because I know we've talked at length offline about uh, big ring gauge, small ring gauge, and I've heard, I, can't, I wish I could remember it so I could do proper attribution, or there's a person in the industry that says Lancero is the best Vitola that never sells. And of course, big ring gauge stuff does sell, and you know that very well from being on the retail end of, of things. It it does, but I happen to love Lanceros and Coronas, and my boss pretty much refuses to order them because they don't sell. <laughs> um, the 70 and 80 ring gauges have caught on at craze. I mean, I think the 6x60 is the number three selling Vitola in the U.S. right now. I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't doubt it's it. It's not my cup of tea. Um, I, I don't like the filler to wrapper ratio, um, but I'm actually digging the box press 7x70, seven so go figure. Yeah, I, uh, I was kind of saying before we went live, and I'm I, and in no disrespect to Asylum because they make great cigars, but I am loath to enjoy a large ring gauge cigar, and I'm loath to admit that this behemoth, this six by eighty, is actually a pretty good cigar, and it, no doubt the fact that it's using uh, all Nicaraguan tobacco, but it's actually. Um, they listed as medium to full, and I know everyone on the show tonight kind of smokes well into the full range, and I I actually find this sort of smack dab medium, like this is not at all sort of the strength buster that I was expecting it to be. Yeah, I would absolutely agree with that. It's uh, it's much more middle of the road as far as body goes than I was expecting. I was expecting a complete powerhouse. And I, I've spoke to 60s, the 70s, the 80s, because you know, I'm the guy that wants to smoke everything at least once. Yep. And, uh, I find the 7 by 70 to have a little bit more strength. Uh, I'll categorize it as medium plus. And I'll yep. also say it has a little bit more flavor and my argument for that is always a Cuban sandwich tastes different when it's pressed versus being ham and mustard and pickles when it's not pressed. So it seems like everything's a little bit more intensified once it's uh, compacted. H having been to the source in Cuba and at three in the morning when you really desperately need that sandwich cubano, uh, I can assure you and, and confirm that pressing the sandwich absolutely makes it better. 100%. Oh, so much better. It's almost on a cigar aspect. It almost is like all the oils are forced to interact and intermingle, which just enhances the experience. Absolutely, and and, and I mean, I think I like the draw aspect. And 
you know, obviously the big thing for me is the comfort factor. You know, when I put this in my mouth, I'm, I'm, you know, not ashamed to admit that it is embarrassing. It is just, it is simply too big for me. And I feel like I'm going to get a letter from my condo board about some obscenity that I'm carrying on in this patio, putting the cigar in my mouth. So I feel like the box press would, would probably be more my jam. Well, Canada, yeah. has, these strict, uh, Canada has these strict obscenity laws, don't they? So you mm. might well be breaking some. That's, that's right. I could get... I've seen the movie better than chocolate, so I know how it is. <laughs> you never know. I could get hauled up on charges. Uh, you know, anything's possible. I've got a Nicaraguan flag behind me. I mean, who knows what happens here in Canada? Who knows? Um, but talking a little bit about the brand, and we'll, we'll get into sort of big rain gauge cigars here as we go. Um, but of course, it's owned by Tom Lazuka. It's made in Nicaragua by CLE Cigar Company. Um, they have a, a substantial range going from 4x44 all the way up to an 8x80. Um, uses a Nicaraguan Habano wrapper, Nicaraguan filler, Nicaraguan binder. And uh, this was, mine actually comes by way of a friend who gave me what he called the large cigar sampler. So I've got quite a number of large, like obscenely large cigars in that sampler, uh, one of which I've already smoked on review. And this is a part of that sampler. And I've got a second one for review, um, which I'll certainly be addressing. But uh, thank you very much, Will. Uh, wherever you are, I hope you're happy. I hope you're happy. Is but eight, um, Is 80 ring gauge the largest cigar you've ever smoked? Yeah, I think I think by far. I think the next largest I smoked was the... Um, the not the Camacho, the CAO uh, Ape Hanger, which I think is a seven by seventy box press. Oh yeah, I remember right? I smoked yeah. eleven by ninety on a dare this week. A cigar, wow! Oh, cigar, the Vitola size is Emperor. I mean, that's that's ridiculous. How long did that take you to smoke? Way too long. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a cigar that every bachelor party should have. Yeah. Yeah, I look forward to that. That'll that'll be a lot of fun for everyone else and not me. Now, did anyone else have have a problem? Um, maybe not you, Barry, because it's a box press. But did anyone else have a problem finding a cutter to to cut something this big? Uh, I used my Zycar MTX, which mm. uh, did an okay job. I I really like shaved it. You know, there's there's not not a lot taken off there. I didn't want to mangle it by trying to kind of wrap these tiny scissors around the cap. Giggity. Yeah. Yeah. I saw where that was going like halfway <laughs> through. You could probably see my brain like, Oh, giggity. On a, on a larger cigar, what I wind up doing is I cut the top and then I trim the sides. Oh. So I kind of act like a barber, so, <laughs> but uh, much to my boss's dismay, you know, I work in the cigar industry, but much to my boss's dismay, 50% of the time I bite the cap. And oh, it's interesting. Uh, a habit I picked up in Miami. Uh, nobody in Miami carries a cutter, uh, but I was worried that it would look shredded on camera, so I actually used the Lotus Jaws for this one. Nice. Well, I, I used the, because uh, I was scrambling and I was looking around, I did not have a cutter big enough, and then I remembered I had the LaGloria Society cutter, which, you know, unfortunately using a LaGloria cutter on not their cigar, but I have to say, great cutter. Um, it was razor, razor sharp. I mean, crazy razor sharp and ended up making a really nice cut. Um, there's no shredded pieces of tobacco, the caps intact. So, uh, so far so good. And the draw is excellent. In fact, we're kind of remarking before the show that I was a little surprised at how resistant the draw was because my experience, and I don't know what you guys feel like, but my experience with large ring gauge cigars is that typically they, they have a very loose draw, like crazy open draws. I don't know. What, what are you guys? That, that's expect? typically my experience too. I, I really expected it to be completely like wide open, um, but it's got, you know, what you would call a good draw. And I think that's part of the issue. I mean, I, not that it's part of the issue, so to say. I think a lot of people are turned on by ring cigars because of the value. I mean, yeah. you can get a mm-hmm. though that's like seven ninety nine at fifty ring gauge, and then you can get the um, eighty ring gauge <clears throat> at roughly around nine nine fifty somewhere in that range. So you're almost doubling, not almost double. Well, you're coming close to doubling the ring gauge, but you're only going up a dollar fifty. So I think yeah. some companies skimp on their tobacco, where with Asylum. They're actually taking the time to really pack the cigar, so you don't get that drawer issue. Yeah, and I think it's I think it's pretty clear based on at least the you know the first forty five minutes of smoking and half inch of cigar that it's clear that they've blended this cigar 
for this size. It's not something they've just slapped together to be a, you know, a, a gimmick cigar. They've actually blended this cigar to be a cigar that people will enjoy. And I think it's pretty clear. Yeah, it, it definitely shows that they kind of, uh, contrary to what my assumption was, they kind of have some expertise in making crazy big ring gauge cigars. They know how to blend it and they know how to roll it. I think a lot of companies take a smaller ring gauge and they blend up. Yes. Where Asylum yeah. takes a bigger ring gauge and then blends down. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly what my impression is based on this. Yeah. Now, it was interesting, Barry, because we're in a, you know, I, I, I do want to apologize. We we're going to have you on the show and then we decided to have you on the show for the big ring gauge show, which is probably not necessarily the best show. You know, we should have picked a Lancero or a Corona show, but I digress. Uh, you brought up an interesting point that I'd never considered. And we were talking about sort of big ring gauge. We we're talking about the value. But you brought up something that I'd never even considered, which was big ring gauge and big dudes. And I never even thought about that before. Yeah. You know, I'm, like I said, I like Lanceros, but as a guy that's six, one, almost 400 pounds, I look a little flamboyant holding a Lancero. Mm. So yeah. the largest cigar, it's my stature. It's like, you know, some people use a smaller lighter, but I actually use a tabletop lighter as my pocket lighter because I'm a bigger <laughs> guy. It just, it just looks natural. And plus, all the girls think I'm happy to see them. <laughs> Which you are, but you also have a lighter in your pocket. Yes. <laughs> no, but I, I think there's a lot of value to that. And, and like I said, as being a, a shorter guy, a smaller guy, I think one of the few mediums in the cigar industry uh, which is a major outlier, I'd never considered, you know, if you're a big dude, if you're six foot plus, 250 plus, you probably do feel pretty silly smoking, even a Robusto though, if you've got big mitts, that's going to look really ridiculous in your hand versus, you know, a seven by 70 or, or larger, which is going to look like a Robusto size cigar in your hands because you're just, you're a naturally bigger dude. And I, again, I'd never even considered such a thing before. And I think that makes a lot of sense. But I think the I think the primary driving point on the larger ring sizes is value. Mm -hmm. uh, I think a lot of the a lot of the cigar smokers aren't like us, um, and, and I'll use the cigar term "cigar geeks" affectionately amongst my yeah. friends here. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people look for value, and you know they don't want to spend ten dollars on a Lancero when they can spend you know eight dollars on a cigar that's more than almost triple the size, yeah. uh, double the size at least. Uh, it, it comes down to value. Yeah, I think, you know, we're both from the, the retail spectrum of things. And, you know, we know for a fact, people don't come in and buy Lanceros. The, the cigars that they buy are the bigger ring gauge cigars. They fly off the shelf. I know that from operating B&Ms up here. And there's a huge disconnect between what cigar geeks want and what actually sells. And at the end of the day, like it or not, the cigar industry is a business and they need to make what sells. And this is what sells. Well said. Yeah. So I'm going to get into our uh, first station break here before we uh, start talking about our pairings. I'm excited. I've been sneaking some sips. I think we've all been sneaking some sips here because mm. we're, we're in for the long haul tonight with these cigars. But uh, just remind, I want to remind our audience that you are tuned into Sharing Our Pairings, which is broadcast live, picked up on the Armed Forces Radio Network. We're here with our special guest, Barry Stein from the Cigar Authority. And my co-host, Trippy Trent, uh, we can be found on YouTube.com and, of course, Facebook Live. And, of course, our podcast listeners who are all over the world, I keep seeing weird country codes pop up and I have to look them up. So wherever you're listening in the world, we certainly appreciate that. Please stay tuned for a word from our sponsor. Sharing Our Bearings is brought to you by Gurkha Cigars. Gurkha Cigars, makers of the world's finest cigars. Try the 93-rated Heritage featuring a Rosado, Ecuador, and Habana wrapper, Nicaraguan binder, and Dominican, Pennsylvanian, and Nicaraguan fillers. Blended by Gurkha's blending team at American Caribbean Cigars, it is hand-rolled Nicaragua and available in 35-count boxes. Talk to your local B&M about the Heritage today, or talk to them about other fine Gurkha cigars. Whatever your taste preference is, Gurkha has a cigar that's right for you. And we're back, and we're talking about the Asylum 13 large ring gauge stuff. We're doing some pairings, and I, I kind of want to just jump right into it, gentlemen. And I'm going to kick it off because uh, I've been kind of nursing my Johnny Walker, and, you know, I feel like this is kind of the pairing that would kind of go well with this cigar. It's, you know, what I would call an everyman pairing. And I'm very happy to see this back on the market. This is the classic Johnny Walker green label, uh, and we'll get into that in just a second. But this has kind of been one of my mainstay 
uh, blended single malts that I have in my cabinet. I was really sad back in 2012 when they pulled it off the, uh, pulled it off the market. And then of course they brought it back in 2016, which I was very happy about. So, you know, I stopped cursing Diageo's name. Um, but a little bit about Johnny Walker, because, you know, everyone's heard about them, but a lot of people don't know that blended, blended malts and blended whiskeys really comprise over 90% of the whiskey that's sold in the world. So, you know, we're talking about big ring gauge versus Lanceros. There's a lot of crossover in the whiskey industry where guys like me who would drink uh, a aged statement single malt or in the minority that is not the majority of consumption in the world the majority of the consumption in the world is in fact blended malts and blended whiskeys johnny walker to give you a sense of their sales annually they sell over 170 million liters which is 44 almost 45 million freedom gallons in spirit which is just insanely huge um they started up in 1820 of course they have the iconic square bottle everyone knows the johnny walker packaging and the reason they came out with a square bottle well fits fits better on the shelf. You have a round bottle, you have a square bottle, you can fit more bottles on the shelf more neatly. And of course there's less breakage because your hands fit around it a little bit better than a round bottle. In 1867, they were the first company to introduce what was called a blended whiskey. And they they called that the uh, old Highland whiskey. That was the first blended whiskey. So they kind of introduced blended whiskey to the market, created that niche. Um, and then unfortunately in uh, 2009 slash 2012, they uh, ended up moving from the original facility, which was uh, Kilmarnock and uh, moved it to the Diageo plants, which were uh, Level Fife and Shield Hall, which are all located in Glasgow, no doubt because Glasgow is near the ocean and much easier to ship product out. So undoubtedly, uh, you know, big financial thing. Someone is just messaging the crap out of me. I don't know who that is, but they can ignore me because we are live. Um, so the green label discontinued in 2012. It is a blended single malt. What does that mean? Well, that means that all the whiskey that goes into this is in fact single malt whiskey. It's not grain whiskey. Um, all of it has to be minimum 15 years age statement. Undoubtedly, there's stuff in there that's older than 15 years because that's just how it works. But the youngest whiskey, the youngest drop of whiskey in this bottle has to be the, the minimum age statement, which is 15 years. And it's comprised of Speyside, Highland, Lowland, Island malt. So it's pretty, pretty wide range. Um, and they did make a note of saying that the recipe is the same as the original 2012. They didn't go and change the recipe. I'm going to take some sips here. I'm going to, that was a long diatribe. So I'm going to let Trippy talk about his first pairing of the night. All right. So I've got a Japanese whiskey that I had a few months ago. It was right when I got back from uh, uh, Puro Sabor. And I had a cold, so I didn't really get a good read on it. Uh, but if you are curious about it, I do have – I'll go over it a little bit. I don't want to completely go back over stuff that I've already gone over. Um, it's – I'm going to try to say this again, and I'm going to mess it up. Egashima Akashi. Uh, Egashima translates to white oak. And some of the bottles say white oak. Some of them don't. Um, And even though it's called white oak, it's not aged in white oak barrels. Uh, They were originally a sake producer, and they claim that they were the first distillery that was actually licensed to make whiskey prior to even, uh, was it John Yamazaki was the first one? Yeah, Yamazaki. He usually claims to be the first one. Um, Igashima, Igashima started about a year before Yamazaki actually opened. Um. They say that they still use sake making techniques in making this whiskey, so they don't really detail what that is. It's got a unique mash bill, which is 70% corn and 30% lightly peated barley from Scotland. Um, so it's kind of a, a mix of what would typically be in a bourbon and what would typically be in a scotch. And it's actually aged for three years in American oak shochu casks, uh, which is uh, sort of a fortified version of sake that's actually distilled rather than brewed then they age it in x bourbon barrels for an amount of time they don't really specify and then it's finished in sherry casks for two years and the first time i had this i wasn't really getting much sherry because i kind of had that congestion and just you know my taste buds were off Uh, but this thing's kind of a sherry bomb which surprised me nice sherry what have you got so I'm smoking a bur- – I'm smoking. I'm drinking – I've drank almost half a bottle already. <laughs> uh, but I'm drinking a bourbon that's made just in the north of me in Maine. 
and it was founded by a father and son, uh, David and David Woods. And it's called Wiggly Bridge, as is the name of the distil distillery. And it was founded on repeal day in 2013, which was a repeal of prohibition. And uh, the, it's a really small batch bourbon whiskey. Um, it was originally distilled in 60 gallon handmade copper pot stills. It's a, it has a reddish amber color. And what I love about this is they disclose the blend. And I really wish the cigar industry was more forthcoming like the liquor industry was. But it's a blend of 57% corn, 38% rye, and 5% malted barley. The bourbon is aged in smaller than traditional barrels. And it's aged for 22 to 26 months on the original release. And it's bottled at 48% alcohol by volume. And it's sold on the shelves at 86 proof, um, which is 43% alcohol uh, by volume. It's distilled from a sour mash recipe on the homemade copper pots at the Wrigley Bridge Distillery. And uh, Wrigley Bridge is actually one of the smallest suspension bridges in the world. And local law up in Rye, Maine, which has one of the most photographed lighthouses in the world, um, it got its name from a group of Girl Scouts that walked across the bridge and noticed that the bridge kind of wiggled. Um, so that's how it got it, its name. Um, it's very sweet. There's notes of caramel and vanilla. And I'm a guy that bounces back and forth between risky and rum. And there's a lot of similarities in this to rum in the terms of the sweetness. And I wasn't a big bourbon drinker until I came across this, this, uh, this, this brand that my brother-in-law uh, introduced me to. Um, and if you're not a fan of bourbon, I'm going to say you should definitely try it. Um, but it's really, really sweet. There's caramel, there's vanilla, and it pairs well with the cigar. And it brings the sweetness of the tobacco out. And it definitely creates a great experience with a full-bodied smoke. And uh, that's what I'm drinking, the whiskey, Wiggly Bridge Small Barrel Bourbon Whiskey, which is a tongue twister. <laughs> I love I the love, name, though. Yeah, I was going to say, I love the name yeah. Wiggly Bridge. It's just fun to say, and it sounds like an awesome whiskey. Yeah, and I actually spoke to the owners of the company today, and you know they went from 60-gallon copper pots down to 30-gallon copper pots. Their aging wow. has changed. You know, It used to be 22 to 26 months. And I guess with each blend, it needs either a little bit more time or a little bit less time. And I was a little nervous because, you know, up here I bought it at the liquor store, which is controlled by the states, and you know, here in New Hampshire. And the clerk at the store told me that it's going to be difficult to get by because it's between seasons. Oh, well, thank you, the people at Wiggly Bridge told me that wasn't the case. Uh, but in July, there, there could be a period of a few weeks as they get into the next batch. Until that gets on the store, and get, until that gets on the uh, shelves, and uh, he actually disclosed to me that in two years the company is going to release their first ever single malt that's going to use Vienna malt and barley that's grown in Maine. Um, so this is a company that's been on my radar for a little bit less than a year, but they definitely have me sold. And they do vodkas, they do gins, they do rums, and uh, I definitely plan to stick with them for a while. We've got you da David and Amanda from Wiggly Bridge watching. Uh, David wants to, first of all, they both gave shout outs to you, Barry, for putting them on the show. And David wants us to know that they're now using a 275 gallon still. So you might be seeing some more bottles of that. Definitely. He told me that their distribution has grown. And, and hopefully, and I don't, you know, I don't mean this negatively, but hopefully as you grow this small barrel, uh, bourbon whiskey that really turned me on stays the same and uh, I have great confidence after speaking to them on the phone today that they're going to stay true to themselves and continue um, down the path that they've laid out before them nice yeah I mean I love small batch stuff like that I mean I'm always a big fan of small distilleries I'm a huge fan of boutique cigars obviously but boutique distillers especially because I think you know and, and I'll probably get into this tomorrow night with Coop but to me there is there is a an aspect of so much of your of your person in that company, and I think that passion comes out in the spirit where they're looking to produce quality spirit. They're not. I mean, nobody gets rich necessarily by starting up a certainly by starting up a distillery, but it's cool that they're coming out with a really great product and they're and they're you know they're really getting behind that with their passion. What's really cool about it, you know, according to the, their website, they're all self taught. 
So oh, wow. Wow. I'm assuming there was a lot of trial and error in the beginning, uh, but I think they've accomplished what a lot of bourbon makers, or at least to my palate and my taste, that they haven't been able to achieve. I mean, this this if like if if this was a cigar, I would give it like a 97, 98 rate. It's just, <laughs> wow. it's, just it's phenomenal. So talking about the cigar, um, I am, cause I'm about, uh, maybe a three quarters of an inch, almost an inch in now. And one of the things I do like if, and I think Asylum has done really well is if you're making a cigar that this, that's this big, you can't make a cigar that's going to bowl you over because by the time you get to the halfway point, you're going to be reaching for a bucket. You're going to be bowled over. It's oh, just yeah. going to be too much. Right. And I think what they've done, uh, I can, I can already tell a transition where it was, t- like I was saying, it was kind of medium bodied, but it's already picking up at the one inch mark where I'm getting, and Barry kind of touched on it. There's some sweetness. I'm getting a little bit of spice, but much less than kind of what is what I was expecting for a Nicaraguan Habano wrapper on this. I'm getting quite a bit of spice on mine, but I'm, I am a little further in and mine is a little smaller mm. than yours. It's in and, ring gauge. And for me, the Wiggly Bridge has such dominant flavors such incredible sweetness for me it's masking the spice the pepper on the cigar Mm -hmm. and it's really showcasing the sweetness of the smoke and i think that's like one of the great things about the pairings if you find a liquor that pairs well with a cigar it can heighten the notes that you appreciate by masking some of the, the notes that you might not appreciate um and you know i enjoy pepper but i'm not a huge fan of a cigar that has leather but if you have a cigar yeah. that creates a little bit of the yin to the yang, it can help mask that. Yeah, I find with a really leathery cigar that uh, some sweetness in the pairing really helps out. And it, it doesn't necessarily mask it, but it makes it more palatable for me. Now, I do have to say on this um, Asylum 13, the finish on it is actually very nice. And I'm with you, Barry. I'm not a fan of a big leathery finish. Uh, I'm finding the, the finish to this to be quite clean. And with the Johnny Walker... I think we're having a similar pairing experience. I've got a little bit of spice coming off my Johnny Walker, but for the most part, and, and I think this is really why people drink Johnny Walker, it's just, it's very smooth. It's got a nice little sweetness to it that's not sickeningly sweet. It's not overpoweringly sweet. And then it's got a little bit of zip on the spice. And the spice on the Johnny Walker is actually kind of taking over any of the spice from the cigar. And together, I mean, I'd be more than happy to finish off half this bottle of Johnny Walker and finish this cigar, you know? I, I don't know how the show would go, but... I would be very, very entertained. You got to catch up to me because I'm already halfway. <laughs> As you can tell, I keep trip over my words. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it, it, it just enhances the caramel and mocha sweetness from the cigar. And uh, even a little bit of vanilla is starting to creep into the smoke as well. And uh, while not a fan of a big ring gauge cigar, the box press mixed with the or joined or paired with the Wiggly, Wiggly Bridge bourbon is just, it's a great pairing. Trip, what about you? How's your experience going so far? Good. I, I'm kind of having the same experience as you guys. I've got a sherry bomb here with a little bit of peat. It's got some sweetness. It's got some smoky. And it just pairs really well with the sweetness and the spice of this cigar. Sounds good to me. Well, we'll take our next station break here and come back. And uh, Barry, you can either switch up to your second or switch up to your second or second in our third pairing. Because we're going hard tonight. we got three pairings here. So we're going to get into our first second station break and uh, second station break is brought to you by Cigar Oasis, who are the market leaders and innovators in electronic humidification. If your cigars are not protected by a Cigar Oasis electronic humidifier, are your cigars really protected? You need to set it and forget it to get. You need to find out more at CigarOasis.com. I use Cigar Oasis products. Trippy, I know you you use Cigar Oasis products. What do you use at home for your uh, cigars? Cigar Oasis Magna. I didn't know that we were to me, but I actually don't keep a humidor at home. You know, I work, <laughs> I work at one of the greatest cigar shops in New Hampshire, and uh, they have one of the greatest humidors in the world. So I just grab them as I need them. Um, so I actually don't own a humidor currently. What a problem to have. <laughs> and that's uh, two guys, right? You guys have three locations in New Hampshire? Three locations, Seabrook, Nashua, Salem, and online at twoguyscigars.com. Uh, so with all due respect to Cigar Federation, if Cigar Federation doesn't have it or they don't have it in stock, come on over to us and pay us a visit. We can dig it. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm loath to give up my Johnny Walker here um, because I am very much enjoying it, but I do have two other tasty pairings and I want to get into those. 
uh, while we still have some show left. And I'm sure we're going to get into some more of that as we get on in the After Dark segment. So if you're tuning in live, make sure to tune in after the show. We're going to have an After Dark segment because we got a lot of cigar to go. But I've got something kind of special here. And this is the Glen Livet. And I'll hold that up so our audience, our live audience can see that. Now, what's interesting is I was talking pre-show that I had never had a Glen Livet on the show before which blows me away because at any given time I have two or three bottles of Glenlivet in my cabinet at all times. So I don't know what's going on that I haven't had a Glenlivet, but um, hold that up to the camera. It's got that nice golden amber color to it. And uh, first of all, since we haven't talked about the Glenlivet on the show, or at least uh, I think Trippy, you've talked about them before, but I've never talked about them. Yeah. I believe I had the Glenlivet 12. That's right. Before. That's right. So uh, Glenlivet, of course, found in 1824, back when it was illegal to uh, distill and sell spirit. That didn't stop them in good Scottish, uh, good Scottish tradition. Um, the still was then moved in uh, 1858. Uh, it is a Speyside distillery, and they use Josie's Well as their uh, water source. They have seven wash stills, seven spirit stills, and they produce a whopping 10.5 million liters of spirit a, a year, which is 2.77 million freedom gallons, which is a lot of spirit. That's a very large distillery. Uh, the founder was George Smith, and he was he was producing and selling whiskey when it was uh, when it was illegal to do so, and that's kind of how he got his start. Now the company's owned by Pernod, Pernod Ricard, and. Um, the other thing I guess to comment on here is uh, if you looked at a bottle of uh, whiskey prior to 1985, some other bottles were using the Glenlivet name on their bottle to refer to the region, but due to a lengthy lawsuit now, they can't do that anymore, and the name belongs to the Glenlivet, which is why they say very prominently in the bottle, the Glenlivet, because there is only one Glenlivet. What makes this spirit that I'm drinking tonight special is this was kind of a... Um, what you call sort of a social media type uh, spirit because they have a club called the Guardians Chapter, which is kind of a whiskey club. And they sent them in 2013, they gave them three samples of whiskey, told them to pick one of the three samples for bottling, and then they bottled that. Um, and this is the result. It's a, it's a no-age statement. It is aged in American ex-bourbon casks and then finished in Oloroso sherry casks. Comes in at 48.7% ABV, which is 97.4 freedom proof. So we're, we're dealing with some Whoppers tonight. And uh, it smells delicious. I'm going to take some sippies here and uh, see if I can get some tasting notes. And uh, Trip, why don't you talk about your second pairing of the night? Sure. So, and about the Glenlivet. So I know that the reason they're called the Glenlivet is because we, originally you couldn't trademark the name Glenlivet because it's a place. That's right. Uh, so other brands would put Glenlivet on their bottle because they were in the same city, but they didn't. They weren't Glenlivet. They weren't the same company. Um, and they could trademark the Glenlivet. So that's why that came up. And then, of course, there was that whole legal battle. But what I'm drinking is a Johnny Walker. Nice. Uh, this is a Johnny Walker I've featured before, the Spice Road from the Explorers Collection. Uh, I'm not sure what it's based on. Based on the price point, I think it's kind of a twist on the red. Um, but I find it to be way more palatable than, than the Johnny Walker red or black. Um, it's, if you haven't heard of the Explorers Club collection, it's stuff that's only available in, uh, duty-free shops all around the world. Pretty much every duty-free shop I've seen from Nicaragua to Mexico to Canada to Europe has the Johnny Walker Spice, or, uh, Explorers Club collection. And they've got, I think, five or six different, uh, bottlings now of the Explorers Club collection that are different blends. This particular one tends to be a little bit more smoky and a little bit more rich uh, than than the typical Johnny Walkers you're going to find. So I'm going to take a couple sips. And Barry, if you would like to talk about yours now, you can. If you want to keep drinking that Wiggly Bridge, you can. <laughs> Listen, well, I'm going to switch over. I'm going to I'm going to uh, I'm going to pour myself some Glen Fittich, uh, U.S. exclusive, 14 year, and it's a bourbon barrel reserve. And the Glen Fittich 14-year-old Bourbon Barrel Reserve has a 43% alcohol by volume, and they come packaged in 750 milliliters. And you mentioned square bottles before, but I'm going to one-up you. The one thing I like about Glen Fittich is the bottle almost has a triangular feel to it, yeah. which allows your finger – to me, it's the best grip on a bottle without those hard edges of a square bottle. Yep. Uh, For those nights where you're just drinking straight from the bottle. 
for those like <laughs> it, it's been nice like that. So uh, the, the the Glen Fittich fourteen uh, spends fourteen years in ex bourbon American oak casks, and it's transferred over to a deep charred new American oak barrel, and uh, the result is this rich ri- this rich um, scotch, and uh, it has really nice sweet notes of vanilla little bit of citrus and uh the word that i hate to say uh but it has a little bit of synonym and uh <laughs> or as i like to refer to it as canel uh which is the french word for for that spice that i can't pronounce uh just kind of a running joke on the cigar authority uh where i'm part of the podcast uh but i'm kind of keeping it on that bourbon edge tonight um for other reasons that they say you shouldn't mix your liquors, but if it has bourbon in the title, it should be okay, right? Yeah, uh, I don't see why not. But it once again, reasonable. once again, it enhances the sweetness of the Asylum Thirteen TAA. Um, it, it masks some of that that pepper from Nicaraguan tobacco, uh, which I happen to be a fan of. You know, I, I tend to be a fan of the stronger, full-bodied cigars, uh, but I do like the sweetness. For me, if a cigar has a little bit of sweetness to out to play alongside that spice and strength, it creates a nice um, effect of balance. And these two liquors that I've chosen tonight, the Wrigley Bridge Bourbon and the Glen Fittage 14-year-old Bourbon Barrel Reserve, help enhance the sweetness of the cigar. Uh, and I think it's important to find liquor that pairs well to your cigar. And I will say this, if you guys ever do have me back on the show... I will do a little bit more work so I could really get into the <laughs> depth details of the scotches or rums or vodkas or whatever it is we choose to pair on our cigars. I will do a little more homework. Well, we don't, fortunately we don't expect our guests to uh, nerd out hardcore on the scotch. We're, we're just happy that you could be on the show, um, share your, your pairing experience. And uh, you I mean, you already, you already broke uh, breaking news in the liquor industry when you're on the show for 15 minutes. So I'd say you're doing pretty good yeah. so far. <clears throat> Now, uh, it's interesting because I think your pairing is going in a very different direction, Barry, than my pairing. Um, and I'm I, not having had the Guardians chapter in quite some time. I think the order in which I've done this is correct because I've gone from a spirit that was very balanced, very subtle, sweet, light, uh, easy to pair to something that is much more full bodied and is a lot spicier and that sherry note that oloroso sherry which i'm I'm a big fan of any whiskey that's finished in oloroso sherry because it's got that sort of nice uh stewed fruit and like a peppery quality to it and i'm a big big fan and so this spirit is a huge step up in strength um it, it it's still doing the kind of same thing that johnny walker was where the pepper off the spirit is really taking away the pepper or the Nicaraguan tobacco, which is kind of a shame because I do enjoy that as well. Um, but still, still holding up. The cigar is still holding its own against this, this spirit. Um, Trippy, how's that, uh, that second pairing working out for you? Uh, the pairing, I, I actually don't really love the pairing here. I get kind of a, uh, I mean, there's a lot of good notes in there. There's some like kind of bourbony sweetness and a little bit of, peat smoke kind of flavor but then there's kind of a sourness that i i think kind of makes the cigar taste a little bit sour which i'm not loving is it like um like a citrusy kind of sour or is it just like a like a funk like dish dish rag kind of sour no no it's more like a uh like what you think of when you think of sour mash like how some whiskeys, particularly Irish whiskeys, mm. kind of have a, a little bit of that kind of sour note on the palate. Uh, and that this Johnny Walker has got that, at least this time. Maybe it's the cigar giving it that sour note. I don't know. But they're just, they just don't play together too well. Now I'm kind of, um, I don't know if it's tough to gauge the cigar by thirds, but I feel like I'm coming up on the end of the first third of the cigar. And the cigar is continuing to evolve. I'm... Out of nowhere, I'm kind of getting a little bit of a grassy note, like a sweet grassy note. Um, the pepper is dying down again, I think pretty much because this this whiskey is just running over the pepper note. But, you know, I, I'm, again, loath to admit it, but this is a good cigar. This is, the, you know, even at 80 ring gauge, um, this is enjoyable. And this is probably something, this is probably something I would take golfing with me. I think this is probably a very good cigar for golfing. Yeah, I could see that actually. 
Well, maybe. I would. I could see the box press version. Um, for me, the major problem with a cigar this big or a 60 even is that I can't bite it. Like, I like to be able to hold a cigar in my mouth and chew it a little bit. And that's just not happening with this thing. Yeah, I'm going to have, uh, and, and I'm sure the jokes will be endless, but I'm going to have a sword jaw for a couple days after this cigar. Oh, I've already got a sword jaw. <laughs> Come on, who are you kidding? You used to it. <laughs> I am used to it. That's right. That's that's how I got on Cigar Federation, and that's how I stay on Cigar Federation. Giggity. Uh, so, Trevi, how are we doing for uh, Facebook Cigar Federation questions? Any comments, feedback? Our uh, our guest from last week, Mo, says we are pure eye candy here mm-hmm. at sharing our pairings. That's right. Feast your eyes on the um, on the dudes with the large cigars in their mouth. I know that's Mo's speed yep. from Mambacho and Patina cigars. Yeah. Mo loves giant cigars. Just loves so, them. I'd like to talk a little bit about about the two liquors that I've drank. Please, you know the uh, the bourbon whiskey, the small barrel bourbon whiskey from Wiggly Bridge is aged anywhere from, you know, it depends which batch it came from, but it's aged anywhere from like 14 to 26 months, give or take, and please don't hold me to it. Um, I don't pretend to be an expert on whiskey. I, I enjoy it. Um, but you're looking at two years on the Wiggly Bridge and 14 years on the Glen Fittich. And the difference between the two of them are negligible. They're, wow. both, huh. they're both bringing sweetness to the table. They're both bringing similar notes. The Wiggly Bridge might have a little bit more of a longer finish, which could be part to do to, you know, the the less age on the liquor. Uh, But if you put the two in front of me, it'd be hard to say which one I like better because they're both complementing the cigar. And, And I think that's key. And you don't want your liquor to outshine your cigar. You want the two to mesh together. And the, the, these two liquors have enough sweetness to it to bring out the sweetness of the tobacco. But it just shows you that aging, even on cigars, some companies, you know, they claim to use 10-year-old wrapper or use a binder that's been aged six years. And sometimes age isn't always better. Mm-hmm. To say that yeah. it's worse. But 22 months versus 14 years is really not much of a difference. Yeah, th- that's something we haven't talked about a lot, is that while age statements are good to know, it's not as much of a difference as you would think. If you're tasting the exact same spirit that's been aged two years and 18 years, you're going to taste a huge difference. But it's only because of the influence that the aging has on that particular uh, spirit. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, at the end of the day, the spirit is blended with it, whether it's a no age. So I'm, I'm of course, I am drinking a no age statement and, um, it's fantastic. And, you know, all that means from a Scottish whiskey is that it has to be at least three years, but it could have anything in there. It could have a 21 year old whiskey in there. It could have a five year old whiskey in there. It could be largely comprised of three year old whiskey, but it's very drinkable because at the end of the day, they're, they're putting something together that's meant to be enjoyed. And it's, and, and it's interesting to hear those comments, Barry, because I think, you know, there is a bit of scotch snobbery in the, in the whiskey snobbery in the world where some people only drink, you know, 12 year, 14 year, 18 year whiskey. They won't drink a no age statement whiskey. And to them, I would say, try it. I mean, you know, it's, it's really about what tastes good. It's not about what it says in the bottle. Yeah. The, the best, the best comparison that I've, I've had personally is the comparison between like a Lafroy 10 and a Lafroy 25. Mm-hmm. The 25 and the 18 from Lafroy. To me, they kind of lose what makes it Lafroy. It's it's just not always better having an old whiskey. In movies, you know, you always see the CEO guy plop down the bottle and say, "This is a forty five year old Macallan," um, and and having it older isn't always better. It's different, but not necessarily better. Right with the Glen Finnich, you got the twelve, the fifteen, and the eighteen, and ninety nine percent of the time, I'm at a bar. I'll order the 15. I like the 15 a little bit better than the 12. Oh, that 15 is so good. But I like it astronomically better than the 18. Yeah. Same thing with Johnny Walker Blue. Everybody's like, oh, it's aged 21 years or 20 years or what have you. I think it's 21 years. But only a percentage of the blended whiskey that's in blue has been aged 21 years. Right. The other portions to that blue that have been aged far less. 
but because there was 21 year old aged whiskey in it, they can advertise it as such. So older doesn't always mean better. And talking about the price point, Barry, uh, I'm sure the MS, the, the bottle, sh- bottle price on the shelf was pretty substantially different between the Wiggly Bridge and the Glenfiddich, the Glenfiddich 14. Yeah, there was, there was about a, a 18 to 20% price difference. And that's a lot. You know what? If I had a hundred dollars in my pocket, I'd be able to get both bottles, but I would choose the Wiggly Bridge over the Glenfiddich every day of the week. And I, I'd, mm. o- I'd almost be able to get two bottles of the Wiggly Bridge. So, you know, they, companies can market with the aging and the years and what have you. But that really isn't to me as a consumer and as to you, the consumer, that that shouldn't be the reason you're buying scotch. Yeah. And, you know, I don't yeah. want to preach and everybody like, you know, it's like Jose Blanco said, the best cigar to Best cigar is the cigar you happen to enjoy the most. Mm-hmm. Same thing with scotch. The best scotch that you enjoy or the best whiskey that you enjoy is the one that you like. For me, I'd rather save that 18 to 20% and go with Willie Bridge any day of the week. I'd say that's a pretty good endorsement from, from our end. So I'm going to hop yeah. into my third whiskey here because um, it's another one that I'm kind of excited to get on. And this is another uh, special one that I pulled out of the reserves. And this is the Aran. And uh, this is the Orkney Bear Barley. And I'll talk about that and what that means in just a second. But Aran is a very small distillery. Uh, They only opened in 1995. They're considered a Highlands distillery, but they're located in a very small island called the Isle of Aran, which is where they got their name. And the only way to get there is by boat or plane. And it is a very small, uh, very small island, very small <laughs> distillery. They don't do tours, so you can't go there and request a tour because they're just that small. They only produce 750,000 liters of spirit a year, which is 190, 198,000 freedom gallons. And I'll hold up the Orkney Bear because it's uh, it's very light, especially compared to the first two whiskeys. It's wow. it's almost a oh, yeah. golden color. Um, and the reason for that. It's only it's only ten years old. It's very very young by aged whiskey standards, um, but it is bottled at fifty six point two percent. It's bottled at cask strength, and I've talked at length on the show about cask strength, bringing the original quality of the spirit forth. You're not sort of watering it down. You're getting all of the original spirit in that in that glass. And if you want to add water, you certainly can. But if you want to drink it at cask strength, you're getting that original spirit untouched. And the name comes from the fact that Iran paired up with uh, the University of Highlands and the Islands Orkney College and came up with a, a basically a recipe that included bear barley. And what bear barley is, is it's the original strain of barley that was brought over to Scotland a thousand years ago. And they don't really use that barley anymore because, quite frankly, it's a pain to grow in barley. It doesn't or to grow in Scotland. It doesn't grow very well. But it's the original spirit or the original barley, and they wanted to make something, you know, very Scottish. And there's only 4,890 bottles produced, and it's just simply aged in ex-bourbon casks. There's no sherry, there's no there's no anything else, just a 10-year-old in ex-bourbon. And what makes this unique is the barley. And I'm excited to have some more sips. I remember buying this for a reason. So, Trippy, I'll let you talk about your third and final pairing of the night. Sure. So, I've got a, uh, a favorite here sharing our pairings. Elijah Craig's small batch. This is the so newer good. non-age statement version. Um, but a- as I've talked about before, it's as good uh, in my experience as the 12 year was before they took the age statement away. I think they're just, they're adding a little bit more younger whiskey and a little bit more older whiskey uh, to, to get that final product. And it, it comes balanced out in the end. Uh, this is, it's a, a pretty strong whiskey. It's not quite uh, cask strength, but it's 47% ABV, uh, which is getting up there for non-cask strength whiskeys. So I'm just going to talk about, oh, it's so good. Um, oh, it's so good. And I, and I fortunately paired these in the right order because even though the, the Glenlivet that I had, the, um, Guardian's chapter was quite spicy from the um, from the sherry. This Iran is what I would describe as a bit of a pepper bomb for a whiskey. I mean, it is very, very. Uh, you know what? Pepper is probably the wrong word. It's spicy. 
and it's that nice kind of spicy. Like, um, like if you ever have Indian food, it's got that nice heat to it. It's not blowing away mm-hmm. your palate. Um, it is spicy, but within that spiciness, I'm getting a lot of that vanilla quality from the bourbon cask. It's got just as much sweetness as it does spice. And again, I'm shocked. This Asylum 13 is standing up to that, even though, you know, I wouldn't describe the flavors of this, this Asylum 13 as being overpowering. The cigar is still managing to stay lockstep with this spirit. I'm going to, I'm going to take a couple more sips because uh, I'm enjoying myself. I have I'll, ask- I'll talk about mine a little. Oh, you go ahead, Barry. Before yeah, I, I have talk. to ask you a question. You're saying this, this liquor pairing has a little bit more spice. Mm-hmm. You know, there's some of that vanilla sweetness. How much has it changed your cigar? <laughs> Some of that spice from the Nicaraguan tobacco is starting to shine through. I would say at this point, and I, you know, we've got an enormous amount of cigar to go here, but where even in the second pairing of the night, I was still getting some of that Habano spiciness that I enjoy through, although very subtly, and it was really causing the sweetness in the tobacco to, to really stand out. At this point, I would say all of the spiciness of the cigar is just completely gone. Like there's just no spiciness that I can detect in the cigar, but what it is doing. And, and I, you know, I think this comes down to contrasting versus complementary, where the, the sweetness in the whiskey is not overpowering the sweetness in the cigar. So what ends up happening is I reach for the cigar and what I get is this great sweetness, this rich sweetness from the tobacco that really serves to sort of power down the spiciness of the whiskey and even though we've kind of, I've kind of started at something that was quite sweet and moved to something that's quite spicy, all three have worked just in very different ways. That's, in- that's interesting because you would think the spice from the liquor would help enhance the spice from the tobacco. Mm-hmm. But you're saying the two of them cancel out, which allows yep. sweetness to really shine. Absolutely. Yep. I'm going to do some retro hails here while Trippy... Um, Talks about that uh, lovely is Elijah, about Craig. My Elijah Craig. I love Elijah Craig. It's a great it bourbon. It is so good. It's such a good bourbon. It starts off with that that real sweet vanilla caramel kind of character, but it's got a really dry finish, which is sort of contradictory, but mm. that's how that's how it works on my palate. And I think it works pretty well with the cigar. Maybe not as well as the uh, Akashi that I was drinking a little while ago. But the the sweetness and it's it's actually got a little bit of kind of a rye spice. I'm not sure how much rye is actually in there, if any. But it's definitely got a little bit of that rye kind of, like you were saying, John, not pepper spice, but kind of maybe red pepper spice. Now, back to what you were asking about uh, with the spiciness there. What's interesting, Barry, and, and this is probably um, maybe an, a good topic for After Dark, but... On the palate, on the regular draw, no spiciness whatsoever off the cigar. On the retrohale, on the other hand, uh, exactly what you're describing. The spice in this uh, whiskey is really supercharging the spice on the retrohale. So before, the spice on the retrohale I would describe as medium minus, almost like a light plus, very subtle. Now, the spiciness on the retrohale for this Asylum 13, it's, it's, it's kind of reminding me a little bit of like a Don Pepin Garcia spiciness where... Um, I wouldn't call it a pepper bomb, but it's, it's a spicy meatball, as they say, like it is, it is, uh, it has got some zip to it. And and this is, this is not a cigar that I would be retrohaling with this whiskey every single draw because, uh, my nose would be completely blown out. I have to ask you something because over at the Cigar Authority, we talk a lot about retrohaling. Mm -hmm. How often do you retrohale? So it kind of depends on the cigar. Um, I try not to retrohale every draw because I think that's a, probably a little too much and you can kind of overpower your, your nasal passages. But I do believe, and, and this is going to probably come off a little preachy, but if you don't retrohale any part of your cigar, it's really tough to get the full range of flavors off the, off the cigar because your palate is only bringing, you know, X percentage to the flavor profile. Your nose has so many million more receptors than your tongue. Yeah. And you're just not going to get the full flavor profile. Now, everybody can't retrohale a cigar. It's it's tough to do. But um, I would say that at least one every three, one every four draws, I want to retrohale at least a little bit. Even if it's only 10 or 20% of that smoke, I do want to retrohale that. What about what about you, Barry? I totally agree. You don't, you don't want to do it every draw because it, you'll get a little bit numb to it. Mm-hmm. But you definitely want to do it every four or five drawers. 
And, you know, I've tried to teach people at, at the retail shops that we have how to retro hail. And, and, you know, they struggle and what have you. Some, somehow but, it's something that can't be taught. It's right. Weird. But, but once you get it, it definitely opens up what the cigar is about. Because as you said, you definitely get more on the aroma. You definitely get more on the, the smoke of the cigar. And, and that's part of the, the experience. You want that aroma. You want that smell. Because the, the, the tongue only gets five different um, types of flavors. But the nose gets thousands. Yep. If you're not retrohaling, you're doing the manufacturer a disservice. You're doing the grower a disservice. And you're doing yourself a disservice. Yep. So you definitely want to expand your horizons by at least learning or trying to retrohale. I agree. I just want to, uh, I've got an audience comment coming in via messenger and, uh, it's from Jason. Who's a big uh, cigar smoker up here in Canada. He's a member of all the cigar clubs. And he says, I can't help but laugh every time he sees me drawing the cigar. He says, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a little obscene. It's making him feel some stuff that he doesn't feel is quite right. And it's in it. But he says, every time I take a draw of the cigar, he's just laughing out loud because it's the most ridiculous thing he's ever seen. And I, and I have to admit, I do feel very ridiculous. It's You're totally ridiculous. ridiculous. Sleep on this. Right now, you are somebody's wet dream. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> yep. We're going to have a whole segment of uh, customer watching this show that we are not used to on mm-hmm. the show. Now, we, we are kind of coming up to the last couple minutes of our Armed Forces Radio Network segment. So just kind of um, going back over the pairings here, um, I'll just kind of talk about mine first. The Johnny Walker, I think, is an absolute no-brainer. Uh, if you can pick up a bottle of Johnny Walker Green Label uh, with an Asylum cigar, no-brainer. You'll be happy if you're a scotch drinker. It's absolute blockbuster pairing i would rate it 90 91 no brainer the glenn livet was still good but i feel like it wasn't one thing or the other it was kind of in between so i'd kind of rate that around an 87 mark 86 mark still a good pairing but maybe just didn't have enough to find quality it knew what it wanted to be with a cigar the iran is on the other end of the spectrum i'd rate that kind of an 80 88 89 because it is so different than the first two pairings that that huge amount of spice is really interesting and i find myself going back to it uh, Trippy, going back over your three pairings, where are you at? Uh, the Akashi, I think, is fantastic. I think a sherried whiskey with a little peat, like the Akashi is, goes really well with this cigar. I think I went, I was a little too overzealous in estimating the strength of this cigar with the the other two pairings. Uh, but back to the Akashi, I would I would rate that one a ninety two. I think that one's my pairing of the night. The Johnny Walker is just kind of a miss for me. I'd go 85 on that one. It just doesn't work with the flavors from the cigar. And it it really overruns the flavors of the cigar because it's so rich. And the Elijah Craig is a good pairing, but I think it overpowers the cigar a little bit. And I would give that one an 88-9. Barry, what about yourself? I think the first time you smoke a cigar, you need to smoke it without a pairing. You need to Absolutely. smoke you need to smoke it dry. And once you pick up the notes of the cigar, finding a pairing that works becomes a little bit easier. There's a lot of underlying sweetness of the TAA Asylum 13. So you would want to pair it with something sweet. And the Wiggly Bridge Small Batch Bourbon Whiskey is definitely sweet. So the two of them complement each other. It brings out the sweetness of the cigar, and it brings out the sweetness of the Wiggly Bridge. For me, those two pairings, the cigar and the liquor, get very high 90s. We'll say 96 to 98. Um, I really don't want to pick the exact number, but 96 to 98. Perfect pairing. Whereas the Glen Fittich. It doesn't have that well-defined sweetness. Yes, it's a little bit smoother, but you're more focused on the Glen Fittich than you are the cigar. So for me, that doesn't work because you want the two of them to pair perfectly. So I'm going to give that like an 88, 89. And on that note, I'm going to say thank you to all the men, men and women of the armed forces. I thank you for everything you do. I thank you for protecting our countries no matter which country flag you're wearing on your arm. And with that, enjoy your smokes.
And uh, before we wrap up our Armed Forces Radio Network segment, Barry, tell everyone where they can find you on social media and where they can find the Cigar Authority and the Cigar Authority podcast. They can find me on Twitter at at Barry Two Guys. They can find me on Instagram as the Cigar Authority. And they can find me every week at thecigarauthority.com on our podcast that airs 12 to 2 on Saturdays. And we offer reviews almost daily. I'd say 99% daily. And uh, we look forward to hearing from you. And when you can't find it at Cigar Federation, please take a look at twoguyscigars.com. And I look forward to seeing you soon. Nice. And we want to remind our audience, we you can our live audience, you can remain on the show. We've got our uh, After Dark segment coming up right after this. But as Barry said, we do want to thank all our Armed Forces Radio Network listeners that are out there, wherever you're stationed in the world, whatever flag you have on your shoulder, you guys are built to do things we are not built to do. We appreciate you out there protecting our freedoms. Hope you have a chance to enjoy an asylum cigar. Stay safe. Have a great weekend. And as we say on Sharing Our Parents, we want you to drink better, but drink less. God bless and get home safe. All right, and this is our After Dark segment where we can just wax poetic, get ourselves into big trouble. I mean, we've been smoking now for like near an hour and 45 minutes, and I swear I'm not even at the halfway point of this cigar yet. I'm a little past the halfway point, but it's still like, this thing's going to last forever. I mean, every time somebody, because we had somebody in the chat room uh, prior to the show talk about smoking big rig age. And I'm going to throw him under the bus, not by name, but I'm going to throw him under the bus. And he said he's smoked uh, six by eighties and seven by seventies in an hour. And I, I just thought, my God, man, how can you, how could you even take, like, I cannot imagine smoking something this big in an hour because. I don't see how you could power through it. <clears throat> One of the most important things is keeping a cigar cool. Mm-hmm. That's why want, yeah, absolutely. That's why you want to keep the ash on the cigar. It oh. helps create a filter, helps keep the car cigar cool. If you're smoking a cigar too fast, you're heating up the tobacco inside. Yep. And if you're heating up the tobacco inside, you're not getting the flavors and the nuances that the blender wanted you to achieve. Yep. So you're kind of doing a disservice to every aspect of the cigar. You, yeah. the grower, Agreed. the blender, slow down. Life moves fast. And I enjoy it once in a while. Yeah, I-, I think a lot of people who, you know, there's a lot of people who say, you know, how did so-and-so get that note out of that cigar? I don't understand how anyone could taste that in a cigar. And I think people that that think that way, that, that don't understand how you could get any nuance, those people are either smoking too fast, not retrohaling, or both. And I had a conversation with Chuck Morrison, who's the producer at the Cigar Authority. And, you know, he never really grasped the flavors that I got. And he never really grasped the flavors, excuse me for lowering the, uh, the, the camera, but he never really grasped it. And the best way or the best uh, success I've had is when you have the smoke, in, the, the smoke in your mouth, try making a chewy motion. And that mm-hmm. chewy motion mm. will open your mind and it will create, you know, some of those flavors. And it worked for him this past Saturday on our show. You know, if you slow down, you chew, you, you know, you make like you're enjoying that, that phenomenal Italian meal at your favorite <laughs> restaurant, it will help you get some of those flavors. Yeah, every every time I hear, and I've, you know, I, I do a lot of events up here in Canada for the, uh, we've got 16 stores, so I go around and do a lot of cigar events. And one of the things I, you know, probably preach a little bit is, is like you said, Barry, slow down. Whenever I hear somebody smoking a, a Robusto-sized cigar in 40 to 50 minutes, I mean, I just, like, my shoulders go up and I just cringe and I go, man, just just slow down, get, and you know, an hour 20 or more out of that cigar, and I guarantee you that the flavor profile of that cigar will be a whole different smoking experience for you. I'm, I'm one of the slowest cigar smokers you can imagine. I could get a loop, yeah. a Robusto to last two to three hours. Uh-huh. And yeah, of I'll course. sit there and I'm working and I'll write a review for CigarAuthority.com. But I'll light up the cigar right after lunch, like 12, 30, 1 o'clock. The review won't post to 4, 30 because that's how long it took me to smoke. The slower you move, the more you can enjoy life. And yeah. the slower that you smoke, the more that you can enjoy the cigar. Yeah, and- I, I smoke while I'm working sometimes. And I'll be like, all right, I've got you know an hour and a half left. 
I'll just smoke a Robusto and I'll be done with it. And by the time I finish with work, I still have half a cigar left. <laughs> you know, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if you guys feel comfortable with it, but, but Serger, and I know you, uh, you work in a retail shop. Uh-huh. Trip, can I be so bold to ask us what you do? Do the listeners know a, about Trip? They do. I'm a, I'm a software engineer at a, a giant company with three letters in their name. Okay. <laughs> <I'd be>, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think I think I mean you hit it on the head, Barry. The whole the whole concept, the whole idea behind a cigar is a cigar is not a cigarette. You're not in te- you know the intention, and as you say, there's you think about all the hands and all the people that go involved, and we've we've all been down in Nicaragua, we've all seen it. There's a mm-hmm. lot of hands that go into blending and making that product that gets in your hand. It's not intended for you to go out and smoke a dart in 20 minutes and come back. It's meant for you to slow things down, take your time. Forget about life for a little bit. You know, that's your that's your one or two hours or three hours where you can just kind of relax and forget about the troubles of life. And that that's not just about the cigar. It's, it's a whole lifestyle. Yeah. And, you know, I, I think whenever I smoke a cigar, really what I'm thinking about is, when, when, you know, when I'm talking about recommendations for people to how to slow down, you should really be to the point where you almost can't keep your cigar lit because you're smoking so slowly. Yep. Totally agree. And there's a reason psychology sessions last 45 minutes to an hour. If they yeah. last 10 minutes, I'd argue that you can smoke fast. But psychology sessions happen long for a reason. And the greatest therapy in life is smoking a cigar. Because oh, you, absolutely. You, you totally separate yourself from the stress, the everyday realities. And you slow down. You know, they, they teach you if you suffer from panic attacks to slow down, breathe slowly. And there's a reason for that. And when you light up a cigar, you smoke that cigar, you should want to slow down. You should savor every moment. Hashtag dab it off. But <laughs> there's a reason for it. And you just want to enjoy that hour to two hours to three hours. You know, if you're smoking a six by eighty or an eight by eighty or whatever that asylum side you're smoking is, but slow down. Life moves pretty fast. Every once in a while, you got to slow down. Hashtag Ferris Bueller. <laughs> no, so, I, John, you mentioned I, cigarettes, and oh. I think that cigars are like misunderstood by a lot of people. Are mm-hmm. people who are watching this right now aren't aren't the people who have this problem? But a lot of people think that cigars are just a nicotine delivery system. And the way I explain it to people who just don't understand it is it's the difference between a Jello shot and a $50 bottle of wine. Yeah. A Jello shot, you're just doing that to get drunk. That's how cigarettes are. You're just smoking cigarettes so you can get that nicotine. Yeah, actually, cigars, take- it's I'm all gonna- about savoring it and enjoying the moment. I'm going to argue against that. Some of my greatest nights have been centered around Jello shots. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I can't argue with that. <laughs> I, 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 I think Jell-O keeping shots with, are there to get you drunk. Mm-hmm. I, I think keeping it within the theme of the show. I think you know when when I talk to people about spirits, whether it's rum or bourbon or, or whiskey or whatever. One of the things that you know, I've, I've seen people look at me and they're like, "You're drinking that spirit straight. Like you're not you're not adding mix." And it's like, yes. And to me, there's a lot of crossover and probably why I like scotch and whiskey and rum and all kinds of spirits is because there's a lot of crossover to me where I'm drinking the spirit by itself slowly to enjoy the nuance, to enjoy the flavor that's there. I'm not drinking it to get drunk, although it's been known to happen at the IPCPR more than once, you know, half a bottle of scotch in. Who can say what happens? It's a happy but accident. It's it's a happy <laughs> accident, but that's not really my goal. My goal is to, you know, drink this spirit because it tastes good. And the slower I can drink it, the more I can savor it and enjoy it, the better the experience. And to me, you know, that's, I think, why spirits and cigars have always kind of gone hand in hand is because they're really meant to be, you know, slow down and enjoy them and taste, taste the expression. Don't just, don't just bang back a couple of shots. You know, a lot of people argue that. You know, I smoked this cigar and I didn't like it. Well, what did you eat before you smoked it? Mm-hmm. And that, you know, that could really damage the cigar that you smoked. And the same thing translates to, to whiskeys or bourbons or rums or even vodkas. If you slow down and you pick the proper pairing, 
you can really enhance your experience. Yeah. And I think many people don't realize that they'll drink liquor to get drunk. And, you know, you have your angry drunks and your happy drunks. And I'd like to think I'm a happy drunk. I think my wife would agree with me. But if you don't, if you don't do anything in moderation, where you don't plan out your evening, where you don't plan out your afternoon on a back deck or a back porch with the proper pairing, you can really destroy an experience. Absolutely. Yeah, I think I've I've heard uh, commonly this this is sort of on topic, but I've heard commonly referred to as the business test, which is you take somebody out and, and you do give them uh, a bunch of drinks to see how they react when mm -hmm. they're drunk. And they say, you know, they always say the true personality of someone comes out when they're drunk. And, uh, you know, I'd, I'd like, fortunately I can say I'm, I'm a very happy drunk. Uh, and I feel like that yeah. does express, you know, your true personality because there are definitely some people out there that, uh, become, you know, as we, we talk about Logan, there's a reason why Logan doesn't drink because mm -hmm. Chuck Murphy comes out and Logan gets crazy. So Logan, <laughs> Logan doesn't drink. He knows himself well enough to know that he can't drink. You know, I, I don't want to pitch myself to be on another show, but if you ever do rum and cigars, I would hope that you would consider me for an invite. A, because I love rum. And B, it gives me an excuse to go out and buy rum without my wife getting pissed at me. Yeah, you have to. It's a business expense. I'll it's a business almost. expense. 100 percent It's a tax write-off. <laughs> you know, we haven't done a rum show in uh, in actually quite some time. So I think you've got a, Not a since really I've good been idea. On. No. I think the last rum show we probably did was last year. I know we've done a rum show with Enrique Sanchez because Enrique loves his uh, loves his rums in the single malts. Now Enrique um, is fifteen oh two? Yeah. 1502, yeah. Awesome guy. Always happy. Always. always. When, when Best smile in the industry. Life, I bet. And, and, you know, I, I spoke about Wiggly Bridge at the end about full disclosure. Enrique is one of those guys that doesn't really try to hide anything. He's one of those good manufacturers that tells it like it is. Absolutely. When you're, when you're talking about that, I couldn't help but think about Steve Saka. Because Steve is such a, like he, he's a very epitome of what you see is what you get. And you walk up to Steve and you, and you say, well, what's in your blend? And 45 minutes later, you know, he's talking about the third trip. Uh, and it's like, okay, you lost me. You lost me at the binder. I've never even heard of that growing region before. And he's, you know, he's talking about uh, Juan, the guy that's, the, you know, and, and he's got two kids and, you know, he grows his tobacco between September and November. And, you know, he lives at this particular lane, but he, you know, he's not afraid of going into that detail because, you know, he understands, look, you can't bring you can't take my recipe and rebuild this cigar because you don't have 45 years or 35 years of tobacco experience to reproduce this blend. It just doesn't work like that. No, yeah. He disclosed the entire blend for Sober Mesa and there's not, there aren't many people in the industry who could take that information and make the same cigar. Now I want to ask a question to both of you and, and excuse me for trying to take over the show, but John, you've been to, you've been to Cuba. You alluded to that during the show. You've been to Nicaragua. I'm going to assume you've been to the Dominican Republic. I, I so <clears throat> I have not been to the Dominican Republic, and I've not been to Honduras. Although uh, I had an opportunity to go down to Honduras a month ago, but I got the I got the talk. You know the talk from the fiance. Yeah. Which was how many times? To America too much. How many times in a year do you need to go to get go down to Central America? And I said. Now, is that an actual question or is that a rhetorical question? Because if you want an actual answer, the answer is every month. But yeah. I see where you're going with this. So, no, I unfortunately, I haven't had the opportunity. Well, I have, I have had the opportunity, but I haven't been down to the Dominican Republic just yet. Now, now Trip, I'm going to bounce to you. What countries have you been to? Just Nicaragua. Okay. I've been several times. I've been to the Dominican Republic. I've been to Nicaragua. And the reason why I was going to this question was I was going to ask you what cigar make a country you like the best. And I enjoyed the hospitality of the Dominican Republic above and beyond. But there was something about Nicaragua with the horse drawn carts. It felt like you were stepping back into the late 1800s, the late 1900s. But the fact that you haven't been to the Dominican Republic or a trip, and yeah. I don't any you suspect you've only been to Nicaragua. How has this affected 
what you smoke. Do you find yourself smoking? And I know, I know, surgeon or John or whatever you're known by on this show. <laughs> <laughs> I know you've been to Cuba and you've been to Nicaragua, and Canada sells both Cuban, Dominican, Honduran, Nicaraguan cigars. So I'm going to start with John. What cigars do you feel drawn to, and how much is that related to the countries you've been to? So I have I have two answers to that, and the first answer is. Uh, I smoke cigars for the same reason that I drink scotch and it's flavor. And I do have to say that I have a Nicaraguan bias. I find that overall, um, and, and I do find I, fi- I have to fight myself when I'm doing a review because I do have an ingrained bias where I tend to gravitate towards Nicaraguan tobacco. I find for me, Nicaraguan tobacco runs the entire gamut of the flavor range and I don't necessarily find... Um, it, it, which isn't to say that I don't like Dominican cigars because we were just talking about that last episode, but I do like Dominican cigars, but I find that Dominican cigar has to be sort of the, the top echelon of what Dominican tobacco is versus a Nicaraguan tobacco where I find I, I just naturally find more Nicaraguan cigars meet my, meet my, my palate, if that makes sense. And the second part to that is, uh, and I'm, you know, we're on the after dark, so we can kind of wax poetic all night as I ash all over myself. Um, but there was a great lesson that I was taught from Hamlet, uh, Hamlet Paredes, who's now with Rocky Patel. Awesome guy. Awesome awesome guy. And when I was in Cuba for the first time, many, many years ago, um, I was sort of very, uh, touristy in Cuba and kind of overwhelmed by everything I was seeing and just kind of you know, all over the place and just kind of, uh, you know, I don't know, too much, almost too much overload. And uh, I, I remember Hamlet sat me down. He says, he, he says, you know what your problem is, John? I said, no, Hamlet, tell me what my problem is. He says, the problem is you have your Canadian head on right now. And what you need to do is you need to unscrew your Canadian head. And he made this motion. You need to put it on a shelf. You need to take your Cuban head. You need to put your Cuban head on. You need to screw that on. You need to get your Cuban head. And it, and it, and it probably took me... I would say the better part of two days before I really grasped what he was saying, but it was, it was a total lifestyle change to get out of the concept of, you know, I need to be here at this time, or I need to have a meeting at this particular time, or we need to be at lunch at one o'clock. None of that matters in Cuba. Really none of that matters in Nicaragua. It's a very similar mentality. Yeah. You just, you just go there, unscrew your Canadian head or American head, screw on your Nicaraguan or Cuban head. And just chill Let's out. Let's just call it your Central American head. Central American head. I mean, it seems to apply for basically everywhere from Mexico down to South America. See, now I've been to the Dominican Republic. I've been to Nicaragua. I like the old school Nicaraguan feel. And I've gravitated to Nicaraguan cigars prior to going to Nicaragua. But I feel as if after I've been to Nicaragua... I have more of a love affair with Nicaraguan cigars, which leads me to really the, the basis of this question. And it kind, of, it kind of ties into the whole social media thing. You, you know, if you look at cigar manufacturers, there are far more people involved on social media that have a Nicaraguan base than Dominican Republic. Oh, yeah. that's absolutely true. And I wonder how much of that affects the, the social media, for lack of a better word, and, and, and I don't mean to offend anybody, but how much of that creates bias? You know, I, I look at some of my really good friends that I've made since I moved to here in New Hampshire, and uh, I don't want to call them out by name, but they're, they're so big into Nicaragua because of the social media aspect of of people who make cigars in, in Nicaragua. Uh, so I'm curious to your feel how much that dictates personal preference. For me, I don't think that made a big difference. Uh, I, so for me, like the, the light bulb moment with cigars for me, I walked into the Davidoff store in New York City, one of the Davidoff stores. It was the one at, uh, I don't remember the name of the street, but it's, it's near the, uh, the UN. Uh, that was I think that shop is closed Cigar now. Well, Cigar Ring is on 53rd and 2nd, and the UN is on 42nd and 1st. Well, this was a Davidoff shop. It was one All of right. the old Davidoff stores. So that would be 54th and Madison. 
and it's still there. I, it might have been Columbus Circle. Is that where there was okay. used to be a Davidoff shop? Yeah, there was one there. I, I wouldn't really call that uh, local to UN, and I don't mean any disrespect disrespect by that. I may uh, have just been thinking Columbus Circle, and for some okay. reason, that but they shut that they shut that That's down. While. They shut that down for a while, and they they rebuilt it, refocused it, but it's there again. Okay. So I remember walking in there, and I bought a Don Pepin Blue Label back okay. when they had like the. It was like a purple label. It wasn't blue Great at cigar. all. Yep. I and, that. and that cigar was the moment where I was like, okay, I, I'm into cigars now. I'm mm-hmm. an official like cigar geek now. And that was the moment that I really got into cigars. And for me, Nicaraguan cigars have always been where my palate has, has gravitated towards. And going to Nicaragua several times has only solidified that. <laughs> See, I'm, I'm going to agree with that because for me, that moment was hanging out in Cigar Room in New York City, and there's a mural around the store painted by an artist. And when you walk into Cigar Room, like the fourth person on the mural happens to be me, which is <laughs> it's freaking cool that I was painted by an artist. But I went to an event, and it was an event with Miami Cigar, Don Pepin, Eddie Ortega, and oh, me. Wow. And may he rest in peace, Gary Arst. And I had just started a blog at that time called thecigarsmoker.com, uh, which still exists. Most of the reviews are by me, but they've been changed. And we'll leave it alone at that. But everybody at that event made sure they were going to speak to me. Don Pepin Garcia, who barely spoke a word of English, made sure that he found a way to speak to me through a translator. Nesta Miranda found his way to speak to me and that would super probably, nice guy right and that would turn into a job <laughs> marketing for miami cigar and eddie ortega and eric espinosa both made sure that i felt you know important and because of that to this day and much to my boss's dismay i love nicaraguan cigars i love that cigar celebrity but in the grand scheme of things where you know, cigar smokers are what two percent of the population. Yeah, and yeah. Actually, yeah. D- Dave did that great. Um, D- you remember? Well, you know, and yeah. Dave did that great breakdown of the actual number of cigar smokers, like an actual count of yeah. premium cigar smokers and regular buyers. And I think it was an eye opener for a lot of people to realize it's you know you think it's a big community, it's not a big community. It's, it's not a very small. And you know, of that two percent, the social media crowd is. Point one point two percent of mm-hmm. of how important they made me feel to this day and I started smoking in 1998 so we're now talking 19 years I still gravitate to Nicaraguan cigars but in the grand scheme of cigar manufacturers we're just a, a grain of sand yeah you know I, I smoked a cigar last week by Aladino and, and if you say Aladino to many social media people, they're not going to know what that cigar is. Mm-hmm. Not going to know who, you know, Julio Arroyo is. And they're not going to even know maybe who even Christian Arroyo is. And I think so many of the social media people are missing a lot of great cigars because they're so into the Caldwells. They're so into the Pete Johnson's. They're so, mm-hmm. into, they're so into, you know, even though Eddie Ortega, and I love him to death, he's not relevant anymore. But, you know, the old school cigar smoker was into the Eddie Ortega or the Eric Espinosa. They're missing out on a lot of great cigars. And it's kind of a shame. Because when I started smoking in 1998, there were no cigar celebrities. Yeah. And you you weren't reaching for that dirty rat because of Jonathan Drew. I mean, Pete yeah. Johnson was like the first real cigar celebrity that I knew of at least. Right. And, and, and Pete Johnson, you know, I used to hang out at cigar Inn in New York city and I hung out there one night till 10 o'clock at night. And he said, Oh, I'm going to come. I'm going to come. I'm going to come. I'm going to hang out with you at 10 o'clock. I went home at 10 40. I was home at 11 o'clock. He sends me a message through Twitter. Hey, I'm at cigar Inn. where where's Barry from a cigar smoker.com. Well, I got out of my pajamas, I threw it on clothes, and I ran back to Cigar Inn just to hang out with Pete Johnson. 
And to this day, I'm a Pete Johnson fan because he went that extra mile. But it's a shame that people that listen to, and no disrespect to you guys, but people who listen to Sharing Our Pairings, or people who listen to Cigar Coop, or people who listen to the CigarAuthority.com, they're so into these geek smokes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So many cigars out there that aren't on the radar. And I don't know about you guys, but it disappoints me. Have you? Have, oh, yeah. Have either of one of you smoked cigars that you think are so good, but because they lack that cigar liberty, it doesn't catch on? Cigar liberty. I, I think one of the, so first of all, I think, the, and there's kind of two things to that for me. The first is, I think one of the great things about being a cigar, uh, you know, quote unquote blogger, which I think has, has taken on a bit of a negative connotation over the years. Right. Um, but I think one of the great things about that is the ability to try uh, and challenge your palate to try products you wouldn't otherwise try. And, I, I, you know, when you're talking about cigars you've never tried before, I think one of the ones that immediately come to mind is uh, Danny Vasquez's uh, The Voyage, the Barracoa. Oh, man. And that and was a cigar. Bo, my friend Bo is huge into that cigar. And so I tried it. No, and, you know, I try to do it as blind as possible prior to a re review. So I don't read, um, you know, where the origin of the cigar is, what the tobaccos are. To, you know, you're always, you're always going to have ingrained bias. So I try not to find out whether it's Nicaragua, Dominican, whatever. And that was a great example of a cigar brand new to the market, had no prior experience with it whatsoever. And I was just completely floored by how great it was. And then when I started reading and I'm like, this is his first release. And I'm like, this can't possibly be your first release because this is like a third year release from an established cigar company, but this is his first cigar release. And I absolutely love finding cigars that have never tried before that are excellent and probably maybe a brand that somebody else wouldn't try because there's, you know, there's all these great cigars in the shelf already. There's Padrones, there's Ashton's, there's Arturo Fuentes, but you can move outside of your comfort zone and try this other cigar that's excellent. And I think the second aspect to that, which we probably all deal with all the time when we're talking about reviews, is the toughest time I have as a guy is separating the personality from the product. And we've all been on the receiving end, or at least I know I've been on the receiving end of an angry telephone call where it says, so why do you hate me? And it, what do you mean? Why do I hate you? Well, you rated my cigar in 86. I mean, your cigar was good, but you know, it wasn't a Padron 1926. Like, I'm, yep. you know, I'm sorry. It's just my opinion. <laughs> I'm just one guy. I'm sure there's lots of other people that are going to like it. And you, you know, you, I, I always say that the toughest review I have to write is a review of a cigar that I didn't enjoy. And then we, we get comments all the time on when I post the review on YouTube where people say, well, you always, you always seem to like cigars. It's like, well, that's not true. I'm just not going to slam a cigar because I didn't like it because what I like, you know, that what I like isn't what everybody else likes. And I might like a cigar that you hate and I might hate a cigar that you like. And at the end of the day, the toughest thing for me to do is write a re review of a cigar that I didn't enjoy and take my, try to take my bias out of that, out of that, uh, out of that review. Every now and then I like to write a review of a cigar I didn't like and, <laughs> I, I I like AJ Fernandez, you know. Oh. I I like the Hoyer AJ Fernandez. I smoked the H up in AJ Fernandez today, and I love the first two thirds. The last third left something to be desired. But I reviewed a few weeks ago the Gaspard Intenso. That might have been the worst cigar I've ever smoked. <laughs> and I feel bad. And I saw the rep today from Altadis, and he kind of said, "Really, you gave it an 82." I was like, you know what? Every now and then, you need to keep it real. Yeah, so, I'm sorry, so, I just didn't like it. Yep, and you it know, you, you mentioned the guy from uh, what was the brand that you mentioned? The, the small brand, Baracoa. Yeah, Danny Vasquez. Danny Vasquez. You know, Danny Vasquez makes the cigars at La Aurora, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and a La Aurora doesn't get a lot of love. You know, and you have the Guillermo Leon signature. You have the 107. You know, they've reintroduced the Cameroon and the Connecticut. And because it doesn't have a social media following, yeah. doesn't get the love it deserves. You know, the Cameroon in Connecticut, and maybe I'm a little bit biased because I work for Miami Cigar. And Miami Cigar distributes La Aurora, but at five five fifty a cigar, you know, if I challenge you to find a cigar that's five or five fifty that might be better. 
And unfortunately, the social media crowd just lets the cigar liberty dictate what's good. So yeah, we've, would, got a, go ahead. we've actually got a viewer question from uh, Todd. <laughs> should be Hager, good. <laughs> who I, it's Thoughts. actually a guy that I know personally. We're from in trouble already. Back when I lived in Connecticut. Well, no, it's, an, it's a softball question. What would you recommend for somebody who's never smoked a cigar? He's, he started watching because we're friends on Facebook, and, and he wants to know what each of us would recommend. You know what? I'm going to go, go first. Please do. What goes last is often remembered. But you want to start, start with something mild. You know, you want to start with uh, Hammer and Sickle has a cigar that used to be called Icon. And they got sued by, uh, by, uh, <laughs> and the name escapes me, but they, they got sued because yep. Icon was uh, trademarked or part of a brand. So they got sued and they decided, you know, since they were in violation of a trademark, we're going to rename the cigar trademark. <laughs> I love which, it. Which is, which is an absolute great, like, screw you yeah. Yeah, moment. It, it's genius. Yep. Now, you want to start with something mild. You want to start with Hammer and Sickle trademark, you know, a, a two guys exclusive. You want to start, you know, something like Garofalo, Connecticut, but you want to start with something mild. You want something that's not going to give you that nicotine buzz. You want something that's going to not make you nauseous. You definitely want to start with a mild cigar. And as you expand your palate, then you want to expand the strength. And that's, that's my opinion. That reminds me of the, the first time I ever smoked a spicy cigar, I it was a JR alternative for a, a Hemingway Maduro, I think. Okay. And I remember I lit it, and like 30 seconds in, it was like, this tastes like I'm eating black pepper. I cannot <laughs> take it. And I put it out. And now I'm like, I crave that kind of black pepper spice. Uh, I think I would recommend like, Something that you can buy anywhere is like a, a Romeo Julieta, not mm. the Reserva Reserve Real, like the 1875. The uh, Bully. The Bully, yeah. That, that's kind of the perfect cigar, I think, for a, a new smoker. It's, it's a little more full body than most Connecticut's. I think the, it's not something that's going to turn you off of cigars. I think the majority of cigar smokers, and if you didn't really start this way, I think you. you You've created a disservice to yourself. But I think the majority of cigar smokers started with Macanudo. Or yeah, absolutely. Started, so. Or they started with Romeo and Julieta. I, my a first cigar was a JR Bully Alternative. And my mm -hmm. second cigar was a Bull. Yeah, my first cigar was a Macanudo Robust. that had the R as the logo. Mm -hmm. and, you know, I'm dating myself. And then from there, I went to Padron 2000. And then from there, I went to Padron 64. And then from there, it just went crazy. Yeah. To the point, like the last year I lived in New York, before I moved to Miami to work for Miami Cigar, and from Miami Cigar to two guys. Uh, but my last year in New York, I spent seventeen thousand dollars on cigars. And I told Ooh. I I told my accountant, hey, I, you know, I have a cigarsmoker.com, which translates into cigarauthority.com. But I want to write this off. And he looked at me and he's like, there's no way the IRS <laughs> is going to let you write off $17,000 in cigars. Yeah. But, um, and Todd just commented and said, what about White Owl? No. Todd, stay away. No, you want a handmade cigar. Premium uh, hand. A premium yeah. handmade cigar. Don't go into the gas station and buy a cigar. Go to, uh, I know where you live. Go to Archway. Tell them you're you've never smoked a cigar and you want to know what to try. I think they have Romeo y Julietas. Uh, they probably don't have Hammer and Sickle, but they might. Yep. It's been I, eight years since I've been the, there. The key is if you live in an area that has an established cigar shop that's been there for a while. There you go. Go to Buttheads in Danbury, Todd. Uh, I, I, yeah, I'm not going to go there. <laughs> <laughs> but you want to go to a cigar shop that's established. Yeah. And they're established for a reason. And you want to go into them and say, hey, I'm a new cigar smoker. I'm curious, to, you know, with the, the whole thing around cigars is if a cigar shop has been there for 10, 15, 20, 30, 50 years, they're there for a reason. Yeah. And you know what? They're there for a reason. 
and you can trust them with, hey, I'm new to cigars. You know what? If a person walks into two guys or a person calls in the Cigar Federation, they're not going to tell them, hey, you know what? You want to dry a super strong cigar, a sober mesa. They're yeah. going to introduce you to something a little bit mild, something that has a lot of flavor. So the key is to go to an established cigar shop. I would, I would absolutely echo your original s- statement, Barry, that, <clears throat> you know, because I, it, it, and it's kind of funny, I got a couple stories to tell, but absolutely when I'm talking to a new smoker, Connecticut Shade is where I immediately land. Mm-hmm. Um, and, I you know, and, 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 and something, what's that? You got to go there. You got to go there. Yeah. Because number one, you want to make sure that they enjoy the experience and you know that, you know, the strength of the cigar and the flavor profile of the cigar is not going to overwhelm them. You don't want to turn, like, how many times have you guys heard a story of a guy who says, I tried a cigar once when I was getting drunk and I puked. And it's mm-hmm. like, yeah, because you were trying a cigar that was too strong while you were drunk and you've, you've ruined yourself in cigars. Yep. And it's so tough to take a guy like that and bring him back into the cigar fold. Um, so, you know, first of all, I say, you know, make sure to, to take your time and enjoy it. But a Connecticut Shade Cigar... Um, is absolutely the way to start. And there's so many, you know, we talk about the cigar geekery and so many of us talk about smoking in the medium full to full category, but that's again, going, talking about the market, like 70% of the market is Connecticut shade cigars. That's, that's, that's the cigars that sell. And social media doesn't realize that. No. You know, social media tends to like the full bodied cigars. You know, I, I often tell the story. The first time I ever had a cigar, I was 13 years old. I was, I 18 was, years old, I got you. I, you know, my last name is Stein, which is Jewish. But I converted when I was 18. I saw the light. But I was at a bar mitzvah when I was 13. And I, they handed out cigars to all the adults. And I told my dad, I want to try a cigar. I want to try a cigar. Let me try a cigar. So he says, you know what? I'm going to teach you a lesson. I'm going to let you try a cigar. I, I lit up the cigar. I smoked the cigar. It wouldn't surprise me if somebody from Disney was at the event because I turned green. So this, <laughs> this, in my mind, this is where Shrek was created. And if you, if, if, you, know, you take a 25-year-old or 30-year-old and you introduce them cigars and you introduce them, hey, you know why you want to try? You want to try a Liga Pravada. <laughs> you're, doing it, you're doing a disservice to the industry. Yeah, that's a great way to create somebody who hates cigars. Yeah, you want you want to start them with something mild. Yeah, I'm bec- I'm becoming famous within um, because we're opening new stores here in Canada all the time, and I run into lots of uh, tobacco owners or, or new franchise owners who have never tried a cigar product before. And uh, the owner of the franchise, Jeff, he he laughs all the time because I take a guy who has never touched a cigar before and I turn him into a daily cigar smoker. And the way I do that is I walk him through the humidor and I just walk through the flavor flavor profile map and I say, you know, this is the, this is the experienced end of the tobacco. You don't want to be introducing a new cigar smoker. And they say, well, you know, what would you recommend to me? And, you know, we go, okay, well, let's go over to the Connecticut end. Let's go to the light. Let's go to the Macanoodles. Let's go to the Ashtons. Let's go to the Hammer and Sickles. And, you know, very quickly, you could, you know, a guy, and, and the number of times I've taken a new owner and all of a sudden I get an a email or a message three days later and they go, hey, this cigar stuff is pretty good. And it's like, yeah, there's a reason why there's so many guys that smoke cigars because they taste really good. And you'll, yeah, you'll start out with a Connecticut shade, but in no, no time, maybe a year down the road, you know, you'll be up in the Don Pepin Garcia, the, the Dura State, you know, the, the La Aurora Maduro end of the spectrum. Uh, but you need to start somewhere and that somewhere really is with the Connecticut shade, that light, nice, easy smoke range. And from personal experience, I think too many retailers make the mistake as, you know what? I'm going to sell my Liga Pravada, which is mm-hmm. $16 a cigar, yeah. which gets me closer to my monthly nut of rent, yeah. electricity, cable, so on and so forth. Where Connecticut cigars tend to be, you know, cheaper. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and that's not always the case, but for the majority of the point, it is the case. But you know what? If you introduce somebody to a $6 Connecticut, in two years, you have a better chance of introducing them to a $16 full of body cigar. Yeah, if you give them that $16 cigar the first time they come in, they may never come back. If you give them that Connecticut the first time they come in, a year later, they'll be coming in every week buying that $16 cigar. 
Right. You'll hit them with stick of shock and then you'll hit them with strength shock. Yeah. yeah. And I and I love taking that Connecticut shade guy and he comes in six months later, eight months later and say, okay, I'm ready to move up. What do you recommend? And, you know, the number of times where I've gone, okay, well, let's get, let's get into the medium spectrum or let's get into the medium minus. Let's talk about the Arturo Fuente Hemingway short story. And, you know, it's a Cameroon. It's a little bit stronger. It's a little bit sweeter. If you're really looking to step up in strength, because, you know, you've been slowly working up that that scale of more complex and more more strength level Ooh. Connecticut's, because there is a range of Connecticut's out there. But, you know, you, it's baby steps. You can't just go from Connecticut Shade all the way into a Liga Pravada number nine, because you're just going to restart the process all over again. You need to take steps along the way. And, you know, it's going to take you some, you know, not everybody can start drinking the Lafroigs right off the start. <laughs> yeah. Not everybody can start smoking a Liga Pravada on day one when they're 13 years old or 18 years old. I'm 47 years old. So I've been drinking, you know, 18 to 47 is what, 29 years? <laughs> you know, you start drinking at 29 with, uh, you know, I'll have a screwdriver. The orange, yeah. ju- the orange juice outweighs the vodka. Exactly. And you move up from that to, say, the Alabama Slammer. It's still sweet, but it creeps up on you. And now that I'm 48, Wiggly Bridge or Glenn Fittich. Yep. <laughs> you you want to you move everybody up slowly. Exactly. Any other questions or comments from the, uh, from the audience tuned in? No. Or shenanigans in After Dark? No, that's about it. Yeah, I think, I think, you know, and Trip, I think you hit on it that, you know, and this is kind of my feedback to B&Ms, is that you, you have to think long-term. You can't just be thinking about the short-term win of a big sale because you got to be thinking, you want to you want to bring somebody into the fold. You want to make them feel welcome yep. in the cigar industry. You want to make them feel like they're part of the group. And I think one of the things I think, talking about cigar, cigar culture, I think cigar culture has been... One of the biggest eye-opening things for me, to the number of people that are so selfless, like how many times you've been in a B&M and, you know, guys waxing poetic about cigars. And I always run into a cigar guy who's like, have you tried this? I'm like, well, I've tried a lot of cigars, but I haven't tried this. Okay, here's two to try. And it's like, I can't yeah. take your cigars, man. It's like, no, 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 just take these cigars, try them. Mm complete stranger in a B&M. And he's like, try these two cigars. Let me know what you think. And it happens all the time. I couldn't agree with you more. And, and you know what? It kind of, it kind of sounds self-serving. You know, you want to create that customer, but at the same time, it's not about creating the customer. It's creating the passion out of it. Loves cigars. And, and, you know, I've walked into elevators with a cigar to unlit and, you know, there's a 60 year old lady who starts coughing and that's disgusting. I'm uh-huh. like, even lit it, lit it. But it's not really self-serving because you want to introduce that person gradually. Yeah. There is, there is a science behind our passion. There is an enjoyment behind our passion. And if you introduce the person in the proper way with the proper steps, it's no longer about, oh, that's, that's smoking. That's terrible. It's about really enjoying what creates those moments of laxation. And by the way, a, a major props to uh, Chuck for uh, coining the phrase passionato because I absolutely love that term. That is just a great, great term. Are you talking about Chuck, my Chuck? Your Chuck. Actually, we can't take great with that. You know, Chuck Morrison, he's the producer of the Cigar Authority. But passionato started with Cigar Journal magazine. Really? As a retort to aficionado. <laughs> as a retort to aficionado. <laughs> you know, within their magazine, they didn't want to refer to as a person who is passionate about cigars as an aficionado because, in a sense, it advertised that other magazine. So they came up with the term passionato. And a cigar journal reader is a cigar aficionado. They're not a cigar aficionado. I, I mean, I love the term. I like the idea of sort of taking the, because I think so often cigar aficionado has this kind of elitism coin to it. You know, like you think about cigar aficionado. You know, it's I like the guys that work there, Greg Matoller in particular. Uh, but it's more about the $10,000 watches. Uh-huh. Cigar smoking. You know, 
I, I'm a guy that works for a retailer. You know, I'll never earn enough in my lifetime <laughs> where I can spend <laughs> $8,000 on a Rolex. Yeah. You know, I'm not, I'm, I'm a passionado. I'm passionate about cigars. Oh. Wholeheartedly agree. Yeah. Yep. So, um, getting back to the cigar, yes. um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm embarrassed. I'm, I am embarrassed to admit that this is, uh, this is a very good cigar. I mean, again, you know, letting my internal bias kind of ride. Normally I would not light up a six by 80. But this is a very approachable, very good cigar. And uh, I've very much enjoyed all the different pairings we've kind of ran through for the night. And I think, um, you know, I, I don't know if it's the black band or the marketing, but I did kind of expect this asylum to kind of kick my butt all over the, uh, all over the spectrum. But I think this is, mm-hmm. this is a cigar that's very approachable for a lot of guys who smoke cigars on a regular basis. Yeah, I completely agree. It's, I expected a, uh, I don't know, a gimmicky cigar, mm-hmm. and it's it doesn't taste gimmicky. It tastes no. like a, a real good cigar. And with all due respect, and by all means, the, the listeners of Sharing Our Parents and the various other programs across the Cigar Federation Network, um, by all means, you should always go to cigar.com. <laughs> but when you look at the cigar I'm smoking, the Asylum TAA and Two Guys Smoke Shop happens to be a TAA member. If you can't find your cigar at cigarfederation.com and you're looking for that TAA cigar, but you're always hesitant, you know, I can't smoke a 7 by 70 I can't smoke an 80 ring gauge. You know what? The 7 by 70 box press, I would smoke all day, every day. It's a little uncomfortable. I'll be the first person <laughs> to admit that. A little bit gay. <laughs> but um, Not that there's not, anything wrong with that. Not that there's anything wrong with that. Hashtag Seinfeld. Um, if you want to try something that's a little bit more manageable, the Asylum 7 by 70 box press is right in your wheelhouse. Yep. Absolutely but, agree. By all means, cigarfederation.com. You can't you can't get firecrackers at Cigar Federation though. <laughs> There's something to be said for that. Nope. And uh, let's see, I'm going on vacation June fourth. So June tenth is the next uh, firecracker, which will be from Fratello Cigars. Oh it'll be exclusively at two guys cigars.com and two guys smoke shop in New Hampshire. I'm I'm excited for that release because uh, you know he's he's in, beyond being the quote unquote gentle giant, um, mm-hmm. he makes he makes some really really great cigars and I'm I'm pretty yeah. excited for that release. You know I agree with you and uh, this is 2017 so in December of 2016 and for the, those of you who listen to the Cigar Authority, um, Mr. Jonathan who's one of our um, regulars it's me Dave. Mr. Jonathan, yes, he prefers to be called Mr. Jonathan, and uh, Chuck Morrison. But uh, Mr. Jonathan is a acclaimed, highly rated, introducted, inter- introducted to the Hall of Fame of ballroom dancers, challenged Omar to a pants-off, dance-off contest. Uh-oh. And Omar... I, they, I've said it a couple of times. Yeah. Omar can fucking dance. Yeah, and Omar Omar wiped the floor with him. But, you know, you know, the nicest guy in the world. Worked for NASA, you know, quit his six-figure, I'm sure, job. And he went into cigars with FDA right around the corner. Yep. He's all in. And, you know, the 2017 Firecracker will be at twoguyscigars.com. But always shop at cigarfederation.com. Unless they're out of stock, come over to me. <laughs> I'm trying to be as politically correct. Oh no, you're you're walking the line yeah. very well. I appreciate it. it um, it's no, our, our fault for having somebody from another from another store on. You know, I I always say, and I I think it was actually I think it might have been Jose Blanco that said this that you know he talked about smoking cigars from other manufacturers, and he always said that you know the ri- the rising tide raises all boats. And I, I'm a firm believer because the, the, the cigar community is such a small community. 
I mean, you look at, you look at my podcast, um, my podcast subscription, and I have like seven different podcasts that I listen to on a weekly yeah. basis. And the reason I do that is because I love getting perspective from different companies, different media people. Um, you know, that's, I mean, I listen to everybody. Um, and you know, we regularly plug the cigar authority. We talk about, uh, Dave at the cigar jukebox who does uh, pairings with music yeah. and, uh, actually, so for for everyone out there, if you want to have yeah. a really good laugh, <laughs> I know where he, this is going. Cause you know I where this is going. This he just had Boofy as he's known in the industry or Matt Booth on his show a couple of weeks ago and, uh, strap yourself in because it's like an hour and a half of just hilarity. Shenanigans. Uh, it's just shenanigans complete shenanigans. Way. And, uh, you know, it's a classic example of like somebody in the industry who brings so much to the table. It's uh, yeah, it's good. Good. Listen. Yeah. You know what? We're, we're, we're all pretty much the same. I try, you know, I'm guilty. I don't listen to as many podcasts as I should. I try to listen to Sharing Our Parents. I try to listen to William Cooper at, you know, Cigar Coop. And I'll even make fun of him from time to time by the way he smokes. Um, but we're all in this together. We're all one community. And if we don't support each other, we don't support, support the cigar community. And if we don't support the cigar community, we're just going to fall by the wayside. So you know, all, yeah. all for one, one for all, you know, that, that's really all I could say. Totally. Yeah, agree, brother. It, it really kind of mirrors the cigar industry where even though everybody's competing for the same customer, mm-hmm. there's really a like, it's kind of unbelievable how competitors can be so friendly. A hundred percent. And I noticed that here in New Hampshire, you know, in New Hampshire, we fought cigar taxes. We fought bans on cigars. You know, one of my favorite stories to tell, it'll allow me to be self-serving for a moment. Go ahead. But in New Hampshire, you couldn't serve alcohol and sell cigars at the same time. I love this story. So David Garofalo from Two Guys Cigar Shop Argue, he went up to Concord, the capital of New Hampshire, and he argued before the Senate about how cigar shops should be allowed to serve alcohol. Prior to that argument, the only way you could serve alcohol is if you serve food. So he argued that cigars and alcohol should go together. But because of state law, you couldn't serve food and cigars at the same time. So he argued and he was relentless again against it. Finally, the Senate said, you know what, Mr. Garofalo, you have a point. We're going to allow cigar shops to serve alcohol. Would you like to apply for the first license? And he said, no, I have no interest in serving alcohol, but my competitors want to sell alcohol. So they'll be here tomorrow to apply for a license. And sure enough, the cigar shops in New Hampshire, they went and they filed to file, you know, to serve alcohol and cigars. And there's some great cigar shops in New Hampshire that serve alcohol and cigars. But Dave refused to apply for that license. And at the end of the day, we're all in this together. And if you're not in it together, if you don't serve that united front... You're going to be defeated. So every year in September or late August, we have the Cigar Association in New Hampshire golf tournament where all the cigar shops, two guys, Castro's, um, Cigar Haven, Twins, they, they host this golf tournament and they take all the money from the golf tournament and they use it to fight state legislation to prevent cigar taxes from going forth, to prevent cigar bans within cigar shops that exist in Washington. And, you know, it's all for one and one for all. And if you're not together, if you don't serve a united front, you're going to be defeated. And unfortunately, in a lot of states and a lot of cities, you know, you look at the person four miles away as the, the enemy well, that guy four miles away should be the friend. He should be the guy you should be teaming up with. He's the guy you should be fighting with to prevent smoking bans in parks, smoking bans in cigar shops. 
if you don't fight together, you know, united we stand, divided we fall. That, that's a perfect example for cigars. That reminds me of actually a quote from Lost that fits perfectly that I never thought about <laughs> in the context of the cigar industry. Live together or die alone. Mm-hmm. A hundred percent. Yeah. I absolutely agree. And I think that's, that's a great note to sort of end our podcast on tonight, Barry. Um, oh and God. I think it's three quarters of a bottle, I'm ready to run into that. <laughs> nice. Well, I think we'll definitely have you back on for a rum show. Cause we haven't done a rum show in a very long time. I love uh, we'll, it. Fantastic. Well, I, we haven't done rum in a long time, so it'll be, it'll be nice to have you on. Uh, make sure to tune in tomorrow night. We've got uh, early time of Cigar Chat at 5 p.m. Eastern. We're going to have Victor Vitale, who we haven't had on in a really long time, so we're going to have him on. And then uh, you can tune in to tune in to Cigar Coop Primetime Live at, uh, gosh, I think it's I think it's 8 p.m. Eastern Standard. I should know this because I'm going to be a guest co-host. We're going to have uh, Fred Rui of Nomad Cigars on tomorrow night. That'll be an entertaining show, I guarantee. So you can tune in to both shows tomorrow night. And uh, I don't know, what do we have going on next week at uh, Sharing Our Pairings? Are we doing the, uh, I know we've got a ton of shows scheduled. I think, next, I think it's the, the Hoya schedule. Dark, Dark Antonio next week, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, next week is the Hoya Dark Antonio. All right, so that'll be a good show because uh, Hoya is the oldest cigar manufacturer in Nicaragua. That's going to be a really entertaining show. So you'll definitely want to check into that next week at our regular scheduled time of 8 p.m. Eastern. No guests for that show, but uh, it'll be a good show. We're going to do, we haven't had a, a Hoya in on a little while, so that'll be a really good show. You'll definitely want to tune into that. But again, 5 p.m. Eastern tomorrow night for Cigar Chat. Barry, thanks again for being on the show. I think Barry's... 4 p.m. Eastern. 4 p.m. Eastern? 4 p.m. Eastern tomorrow night. Are you sure it's 4 p.m. Eastern? I'm, I'm positive. I think you might, you might want to check that because that seems a little early to me. We're, we're doing it early because you're doing Cigar Coop. Well, you can definitely check out the event schedule at CigarFederation.com. 4 p.m. doesn't seem right to me because that'd be 2 p.m. Mountain. But we'll, you can double check that at the uh, event schedule at CigarFederation.com. We'll be back tomorrow night. Check that out. And as oh. we say in Sugar Pairings, we want you to drink better, but we want you to drink less.